Well, good morning. God is good. God is good. All the time. Now you say it. All the time. God is good. Welcome to worship. If you are a first time visitor, we are so glad you're here. You've picked an amazing day to be here. We're going to be baptizing three people in the river. If you have never seen a river baptism, we'll be doing that after church, probably 15 minutes after church. We're going to head down to the edge, which is our youth building in the corner, and you can watch as these people will hear their testimonies, and then we'll get to baptize them in the Huron River at Huron River Methodist. My name is Matt Hook, and I just want to welcome you and say thanks for being here. I've been gone for the last two weeks on vacation. It was glorious. And it was just Lee and me. Yeah, oh, thank you. And it was just Lee and me. We saw, um, one morning we saw six eagles. Six eagles. Two fully grown bald eagles, two juvenile bald eagles, and two golden eagles. I'd never seen a golden eagle in Michigan before. It was amazing. And it was so good. And it was such a reminder to me that we've got some to take time. And if you're like me, maybe you're realizing this reality of life. The days can be really long. The weeks can be really full, making them really long. But you know what? The years fly by. We're talking about eternity. And eternity isn't just a really long time. Eternity in Christ is something so new. We're going to look into it as we look at the final chapter of Paul's letter to the new church that he wrote to Timothy. In the meantime, we are here to bring everything that we are, that we would maybe get a glimpse of eternity. We're bringing all of the junk in our lives, and it's my prayer you let it go in the worship, in the prayer, through the message, to claim God's design for you this week. With that, I invite you to stand as we sing together. I'm glad the band and I are going to lead you in worship. Let us sing with joy, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. One, two, three, four. Oh, 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 it's better 
Welcome to church. If you would like to get prayer this morning, we are going to have prayer ministers at the sides of the church here who are willing to step alongside you in praise or in prayer or whatever your needs may be. Sing the song forever and amen. 
times it's hard for us to even fathom the depth of God's love for us. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I? could sing these songs as I often do every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands and praise you Prince of Priests, the Everlasting Father. We have gathered here today to worship you, to give thanks for who you are and all that you have done for us. Lord, you loved us when we were unlovable. You came for us in the midst of our sin and our brokenness. And so, Lord, we come before you today, praising you, lifting up your name, singing glory, glory, hallelujah to the King. We love you, Lord. We need you. We come today with some brokenness. We come today in the midst of our struggles and the pain and the trials of this life. And we lay them before you, Lord. And we give thanks that we know that when we come to you, repent of our sins and seek you, Lord, that you forgive us, make us new and whole. Our sins are no more and you welcome us into your loving arms. 
Father, I pray that we would feel that today. All who are in need of comfort, are in need of restoration, are in need of feeling your joy, your peace, your presence. May it be so, O Lord, as we come to you this morning. Father, we look around the world and we see the struggles and the brokenness and the destruction in Maui and so many other places around the world. And we ask for your healing touch. We ask that you would bring renewal, restoration to the families that are going through so many of these struggles. But Lord, even beyond the physical, we come to you with our emotional and spiritual brokenness. And we call out your name, the name of Jesus, that you bring peace and joy and new life. May it be so for us this day, O Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And now may we join our voices as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Church, welcome. It's so good to see you all this morning. And those who are watching online, welcome. We're glad to have you worshiping with us. Before you're seated, Please turn to those you're standing next to and greet them with the love of Christ. from the basement of the edge and I'm joined by two of my favorite middle schoolers Tweedledee and Tweedledum known also as Timothy and Jonathan and they are excited to share with you about middle school mission Jonathan share a little bit about middle school mission so yeah we w it was a three-day trip down to downtown Detroit where we partnered with Cass Community Social Services and what were some of the things you did on the trip Timothy uh, on the first day we we um, pulled weeds we did yard work and we mowed lawns that were about this tall, and we did other things along those lines. Okay, and what else, Jonathan? Um, we used old recycled tires to make um, rubber doormats, and we took apart old electronics to recycle all of the plastics and metals that were inside of them. Well, thank you both for serving in that way, and besides the physical things you did with Cass Community Social Services, what did you get out of the trip? Well, I think I built stronger relationships with my friends, and I also built a stronger relationship with Jesus and God. Well, thank you both so much for sharing and for serving in this way. Just one reminder is that today, after our second service, we have our river baptism. And we'd love to have you come join us. Come outside the edge at 11.45 a.m. to hear the testimonies, and then we'll walk down to the river together. Also, in case you missed it last week, we are going to continue with our summer worship times into the fall, meaning we're gonna have our 9 a.m. traditional service and our 10.30 a.m. contemporary service continuing on indefinitely because everyone is loving it. 
Starting September 10th, we're gonna really amp up our children's ministry with nursery during the first service and nursery and Sunday school through eighth grade during the second service, as well as adult Sunday school classes all morning long. And so we hope to have you come join us for that. And remember, you can always get information through the weekly at a glance email and at the Get Connected desk on Sundays. Thanks for joining us this morning and welcome to church. gets me in every hymn and every song it's used is those words 
the waves and winds still know his name. Do you know what that's a reference to? Jesus and the disciples on the Sea of Galilee when the storm rolls in. And he says, peace be still. And he commands those things. And even though that happened 2,000 years ago, we do not worship a God of the dead, but a God of the living. And those same waves and those same winds and those same storms that were coming at Jesus himself and that were coming at those who were with him know his name when he says, be still. We are so glad that you are here. And it is so good to be back after being so good to be away. There's a rhythm to life, and the days are long, the weeks are long, but the years fly by. I want to, we don't always mention it, um, say a word about these, we call them friendship pads, because we kind of um, breeze by them. Please take it if you're nearest the center aisle, fill it out, pass it down the road that everybody else can sign it, and then pass it back so that we go easy on our volunteers who collect them at the end of the service for two reasons. One, if you are new, if you are visiting, if you like a little more information about the church, we send letters out to people who fill this out and help keep track and get you in our data system so that um, you, as you're maybe taking steps to be a part of us in this community. But the second reason is my favorite reason, and that is, and it was hard during COVID, <laughs> we, um, we, if you sign in today and you don't sign in for another six weeks, that will show up. Kathy Ledley um, pours herself into making this work. And if you're not here for six weeks, she's got a list of people that maybe you just didn't sign in three weeks prior when you were here or something. But we want to follow up and say, are you doing okay? We're, we're a good-sized congregation, and there's so many blessings of being a good-sized congregation, but one of the things that we want to make sure is nobody falls through the cracks. And this is one awesome tool for us to be able to do that. So if you would um, fill that out, and um, it really, really helps. I picture this church is kind of like a net, you know, like a fishing net that you would get caught in and all the knots or all the relationships we have. And this is just one tool to help us look out for each other. You know, today we are looking at the last week uh, of the second letter to the new church we're studying this summer, which is the book of 1 Timothy, a letter written from Paul to Timothy, who, who was in Ephesus because the church was a mess. Even that early on, we'll be looking at the last, likely the last letter written um, by Paul, and it's a second letter that he wrote to Timothy from a dungeon in Rome. But what I want to do, though, is first of all, um, share with you a confession. I, I think I have a little bit of pride because I'm pretty thick-skinned. Like, not a lot tends to bother me majorly, but a couple things happened over this last week. Even after coming off vacation, that has made me realize I'm really thin-skinned some of these days. And that in itself bothers me, let alone the people around me who are getting in through my thin skin. And if that is you, I invite you to listen in. For me, it's, I have to confess, I can't stand up here and preach the gospel in a church without telling you... At this moment, I feel a bit convicted and conflicted. Two times this week, a family member needed help. And my first inclination was shouting inside my head, No! No! Where's that coming from? <laughs> so much for being known as the shepherd of people. And this is my own family. In one case, though, um, the night we got home, the, um, I, was, I, I was literally saved by grace because it was late at night and uh, this one came home and all I said, praise be to Jesus, was we need to come up with a plan. Whew. 
And I was so grateful that, remember, um, the years are flying by, though the days can feel really long, that I did not do damage that night by my words, by my welcome when this person walked in. But then, just yesterday, I all but ignored the need of this person that needed something. It was a little bit of an emergency, and I had no empathy for her. And thus, that means I pretended that I had never been in a last-minute need before myself due to my own lack of planning. My excuses? I'm too busy. I had a big wedding I had to do yesterday. We had company yesterday morning. I'm too important. I have too much on my plate to help you with yours. And besides, I want to teach you a lesson. Those were my excuses. And here's the thing. This person that was in need of help is the first person 20 different people would call for help because she's just like that. And I wouldn't return it, the favor. I had some legit reasons, right? But now I realize, and as I've thought about it, I'm so sad for myself. I'm sad for the situation. Thanks, Janelle Hubert, for um, modeling for me what it's supposed to look like. But I want to be a family that truly helps one another. I want that to be our DNA, even sometimes when you get your own self into hot water. I want that for our new church, that we would be a true family, that net to catch people who need it. And we're only human, and if you're visiting and you're looking for the, purpose, the perfect church, just move along because it's not us. But watch out when you find the perfect church, because if you go there, you'll just wreck it. <laughs> but I want that for this church. I want that for our community, that we would be known as a community for helping each other, being generous with our time, with our help, even if it's in a way that I don't plan to help. I want to be generous with our time, our help, our resources, and our encouragement. And I want you to hear the good news. We worship a God like that. We worship a God who is so generous to us that when we're the ones in need, when we're the ones who are stingy or panicking because we didn't plan, when we're the ones, He sends help. Now, it's resistible, but it's for everybody. And the amazing thing is, God offers us not just the help, He offers us a solution. He offers us Himself, His almighty joy and peace, almighty joy and peace comes by His letting us become a part of His solution for people in need, in our families, in our communities. Think about being a teenager in the year 2023. Think they're dealing with stuff we didn't have to deal with back in the 1900s? <laughs> Think about being a parent today. There is a need in our youth ministry, in our children's ministry, because that is our mission, church. And it's not just that ministry over there. That's our, all of our mission. I love that we are a multi-generational church of disciples making disciples of Jesus Christ, our Savior, Redeemer. It's on our wall, if you haven't seen the new display, by the gym. We have senior adults that have legitimate needs, and we want to meet those as well. And to sum it up, Paul writes these words in the last section of this letter to a church that's in trouble. He says to Timothy, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life. The eternal life. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life. 
This is how Paul concludes this letter to the new church, written to Timothy, who was trying to help the church in Ephesus that had already begun to lose its way. In chapter 6, he lists several problems the church had. Here's something wild. People coming to faith, and one person is the master, and one person is the slave, and they're both there. You know, Jesus didn't throw out every system right away. Christianity is completely against slavery. But we can't associate the exact kind of slavery with what we know to be true from our American history in that it was servants and people, and now they're brothers and sisters in Christ, helping people get there. So that was the first thing that he addressed in this last section. And then after that, he lists other problems that the church had had. Not only rich and poor people who work for them now being brothers and sisters, which sure changes things, but then all these people are starting to hop on this fad of this new thing, Christianity, being Christ followers. This is as opposed to the massive ancient pagan temple of the worship of the goddess Artemis, one of the seven great wonders of the world. And so people are coming like, whoa, something's going on here. And they're hopping on board with this and they're focusing on everything but Jesus. And Paul's writing about all of this. And he includes, there's some classic lines here that you have heard outside um, that you might not have known came from 1 Timothy chapter 6. But now you can educate your friends. We'll pick it up in verse 6. But godliness, as opposed to all those other things, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. Sounds like my mother. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. Actually, Joanne never said that to me. But that's in there. That's right there. We brought nothing in. We can take nothing out. Verse 8, but if we have food and clothing, so there are things that we need. We have legitimate needs. Paul's saying, we will be content with that. And then that frees us up with all of our other resources. Verse 9, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Man, if you take this to the nth degree, notice verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. He does not say money is the root of all evil. He says, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money is morally neutral. Great things are built with amazing plans and amazing people who pour their resources into it. But the love of money, the upward mobility, the love of the power or the sense of control that it gives us is a root for all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, in other words, they don't have it, but they're eager for it, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Literally, that is like the sign of a knife in the Greek. That is the same word, piercing themselves with many griefs. You know people like that, and so do I. And then Paul says this, but you, man of God, flee from all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is strength that is bridled for a purpose. And then he says it, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you, were, when you made your good confession. Coming to Christ requires confession. Lord, I am not where um, you designed for me to be. I ask your forgiveness for my sin Not just the ones that I can name, but for the inexcusable. Forgive me. I have no excuse. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We do not do this thing alone. So in the midst of everything that God's word says... Take hold of eternal life is this underlying theme that you may or may not have caught throughout the Gospels, throughout the rest of the New Testament, all those ancient documents. Not just when we die eternal life, but now, sound on the ground while I'm still around eternal life. 
How the heck do you do that? Well, look what comes just before taking hold of eternal life. Paul says it, fight the good fight of faith. Is there such a thing as a good fight? Yeah. If it's for my family and being a family of caring for each other, even if it's last minute and inconvenient, yes. In other words, what Paul is saying is those who lay hold of eternal life are going to have to fight for it. The way of the spiritual life, living your life in Christ. That's how I sign my emails half the time, in Christ. Because I'm in Christ, and what does that even mean? If you're exploring faith, here's the best way to describe it. I am, I am in Christ. I am shielded by Him. I am spurred on by Him. I am comforted by Him. I am um, convicted by Him. I am never condemned by Him. But being in Christ is like being in love. I don't want to do things, go places, say things that pull me out of love. I'm in love with Lee. I don't want to do things that take me out of that love. I'm in Christ. I don't want to do things that pull me away from this love that he has, from this eternity, this eternal life that he is calling us to take hold of. That's a sense of what it means, walking in the Spirit. It's not easy. But this is weird because so much Christianity is about, oh, it's just going to be blessed. You're going to be highly favored and all this kind of stuff. But that's taken out of context too. Jesus says this, my yoke is easy and my burden is like the yoke is the big wooden thing that um, bulls or cows would use to plow a field in that day. My yoke is easy, my burden is light in Matthew chapter 11. But at the same time, we're called to fight and to contest for every step of the way along this journey with God to which it leads us against the flesh, against the world, and against the devil. Remember, it's not just you and God. You have an adversary out there, your own flesh. And then there's the world, which takes your own flesh and turns it into an industry, like the gambling industry, drug industry, porn industry. Let's make an industry out of feeding on people's flesh versus their spirit. And that diminishes their spirit. And then thirdly is um, the demonic the devil and his angels. First John says it this way, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Here's what it is, even our faith. Scripture is full of this idea that this new church is a part of an active struggle. Looks into the words that Paul is using to Timothy, the leader of this people, the shepherd of this people. Flee, fight, contend, hold fast. Paul is telling Timothy, and Paul is telling the new church then and the new church today, it's worth fighting for. It's worth working hard for, even resisting other things for. Whoa. This sounds like a little much. You know, some of us grew up in a church where they just gave you a devotional thought and a feel-good message to take to Sunday brunch after church. That's enough for me some days. Until you realize that following Jesus means laying down your life to live his life, to literally take up your cross to follow him. That's the gospel. But then again, in doing so, you find your true life in Jesus, who said, once you do that, in him his yoke is light. You know why? Because Probably he's carrying it with you, whatever it is that you're facing. In 2023, August, can you believe it's August, mid-August, 2023, the best way for you to contend for the faith is to personally lay hold of eternal life. That is the best thing you could do for your family. That is the best thing you could do with your job situation, whether you are underemployed or unemployed. Lay hold of eternal life. You can't defend the faith by sheer reasoning, although I love to listen to those people. Your victory in Christ doesn't come from arguments given by smart Christian people. It comes when you possess the inward life in Christ, Christ in me, because his life in you is what you most need. This eternity in you now, 
way back, Solomon said God has placed eternity in the hearts of men and women. But we try to fill that vacuum with all kinds of other stuff. But that pang, that longing that you're experienced for, for this home that you've never quite been to, is found in Christ. Because his life in you is contagious, you can't help but show the strength of him, the power, the influence, the outlook, the energy of this eternity that we have found in Christ in your daily life life, your actions, your love, your serving, your giving, your generosity. There's a reason why Paul is steering Timothy toward these things, because this is the eternal life to which we're invited. He says it in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation. It's not just some dream that we have. But in living out this eternal life in Christ, we'll be laying up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that's truly life. Not all the false promises that our children are getting consumed and inundated with on every screen they ever look at or all the false promises that we fall for. But it's in Christ. Christ. This is only by God's grace, and it is universally offered to all people. The only thing about it is, we as Methodists believe it is resistible. It's only by God's grace, it's universally offered to all people. And we are made new by this life. This authentic, abundant life is what Christ offers us. It is free for the taking, but again, the contrast, it costs him his life. But through every hazard that you face, through every adversity you face, through every frustration you face, as I faced this week, that I succeeded once by the grace of God and failed once, Paul writes this to the Ephesians, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. What does it mean? What does it mean for me today? Believe in it. Scripture is full of it. Jesus says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. Remain in me and I in you and you'll bear much fruit. That's remaining in me, the, him, the vine. Jesus said to Martha, who was fussing at him, Martha, hold on a minute. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, yet will they live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. In other words, we are now linked with Christ. And because he lives, we shall live also. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. Since then, you have been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Jesus said to the Pharisee, the Pharisee, Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. This is laying hold of the eternal life. John chapter 3, 3. My question is, have you experienced it? Have you said, Lord, take my life, the remnants of my life, the hopes of my life, the dreams of my life, they're yours now because I'm yours now. Have you experienced that? New perception in this new life, this eternal life. It's new perception. It's new emotions. It's new desires. This life has new senses, new eyes. We see things differently than we did before Christ. Hundreds of us who are here. We have new ears by which we hear not only just the voice of God, but we hear the cries of people in need. New tastes, new touch, new relationships as the Lord Jesus makes all things new. Do we know this life? Does God live in us? Jesus said, Matthew 22, 32, He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So hear me, it's not wishful thinking. Remember, it's the foundation Paul is writing to Timothy. 
It's not just for the super Christians or the people who raise their hands or the fanatics. It's a literal fact worthy of your consideration, woven all throughout Scripture. Lay hold of eternal life. That means trust in Jesus. Put your trust in Jesus. He said, the one who believes in me, even though they die or even though they were dead, yet will they live. And whoever believes in me shall never die in John 11. Faith and new life go together. That your innermost life would be spiritual. It makes me ask, what is my innermost life right now? How do you tell what your innermost life is? Is that what you think about when you wake up in the middle of the night? Is there anything spiritual going on besides the battle in and of itself? Is it about your worries? Is it about your kids? Is it about uh, this battle that is going on between you and your spouse right now? What is my innermost life right now, and what if it would be spiritual? Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. It doesn't mean more cars and more stuff, but it means life in Christ in the midst of everything. And in John 17, Jesus prays this prayer. Now, this is eternal life, Father. He's praying to his heavenly Father that they know you, meaning not just the disciples then, but he says that the disciples down the ages, down through the ages, meaning you here this morning, this is eternal life. This is what it looks like, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Those are Jesus' words. It's a daily thing with Christ. We're not in heaven yet, but Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is in your midst. In other words, we're not in heaven yet. I don't know why I always keep pointing that direction. (laughs) Have you noticed that? Does that bother you? We're not in heaven yet. But but Luke literally records Jesus' words. um, In the believer, heaven exists. The kingdom of God is in you when I am with you. The kingdom of heaven is in your midst. And Jesus puts it this way, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, just hearing his voice over the noise and the headphones and everything else coming at us, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, we've got a part to play. Jesus says, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And what happens then is you and I end up with a whole new set of priorities. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. You know, we say it that way, but it's the emphasis on the word first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first the kingdom of God. And is, it, is it a piece of my pie? My pie chart, yes, but is it first? Hmm, wasn't for me last week, several times. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Like Paul, we say, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 is such a core verse. And it goes right along with what Paul's saying to this new church in Ephesus. And he's saying we fight to protect it. Look at verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance. Meaning there's something pushing against you and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith, with the faith, by the faith, for the faith. Take hold of eternal life. Why such a fight? Because we have this tendency to trade the solid gold of this eternal life in Christ in our lives today for what? Selfishness, comfort, control, personal peace, upward mobility, leave me alone. And we're right back to that famous phrase, In chapter 6, verse 6, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Selfishness, money, upward mobility, contentment, somehow we, especially in the United States, have bought into this. Is money good? Yes. Do people need money to live? Do they need resources to live? Yes, of course. But this 
love, this craving for it. It's like jabbing yourself with the knife, as Paul says earlier. And this is where Paul turns to this ultimate fight. It's a battle between God and money. Jesus said you can't serve both. You have to pick one and let the other one be a resource, be a tool. This is where Paul turns to this ultimate fight. Basically, it's the battling, the unbelief of coveting. Do you know what coveting is? We don't use that word very much. We might remember it's at the end of the Ten Commandments. Do not covet your neighbor or do not covet other people's stuff. It's, it's everything that we scroll for, though, isn't it? We're looking for something. We're coveting something. It's a battle. What it is is a battle against unbelief. It's, it's a fight for faith in the promises of God. The word covetousness isn't used in this verse specifically, but the reality is what this text is all about. Many times he talks about be generous, the love of money, watch out. When verse, chapter five, uh, verse 5 of chapter 6 says that some people are treating godliness as this means of gain in the world's status, Paul responds in verse 6, there is great gain in godliness with contentment. Not in elevating yourself above other people. Covetousness is desiring something so much that you lose your contentment in God. Boy, does that describe people I know. Boy, does that um, fight against my own heart. Covetousness, let me say it again. Let's read this together. Covetousness is desiring something so much that you lose your contentment in God. The opposite of covetousness is contentment. In other words, I can covet or I can be content in God. Somehow, Scripture seems to say they're mutually exclusive. Because when your contentment in God decreases, maybe it's due to a lack of relationship, maybe it's due to loneliness, maybe it's due to frustrations in your life or things that your loved ones are going through and you lose this, you're like, come on, God, and you lose this contentment in God. And so it's so easy when this contentment in God decreases, coveting other things can increase. That's why Paul says in Colossians 3, 5, that covetousness is idolatry. He says, put to death what is earthly in you, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Maybe it's been a while since you've read the Ten Commandments, but let's see if you know a little bit of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And do you remember the tenth one? You shall not covet. Interesting, the first commandment and the tenth commandment are almost equivalent commands. Have no other gods before me. Do not want something so much so that it turns you away from me. Coveting is a heart divided between two gods. So Paul calls it idolatry. But contentment in God is just simply what faith is. It's, it's the faith you're living now. It's laying hold of eternity in my life today, August 2023. Covetousness gives rise to many other sins. Again, verse uh, 10 says, The love of money is the root of all evils. James 4.2 says, You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and wage war. Covetousness is breeding ground for a thousand other sins. Flee from it, fight against it. Again, money's morally neutral, but it can take over. Truth is, you can't take your riches with you. Verse 7, we brought nothing into the world, we cannot take anything out of the world. Or as Flossie O'Connor puts it, there are no U-Hauls behind hearses. I know you've seen the meme, so have I, with the U-Haul pull, being pulled by a hearse. <laughs> but it's like using all your energy to buy up all the Confederate money at the end of the Civil War in the United States. It's worth nothing. And as a collector of stuff, it can be the same thing. If your kids don't want it, all the furniture we have we thought our kids would want, it just has taken over until the rummage sale next month. <laughs> Turns out they don't want furniture that's 50 years old. What is wrong with them? 
You can't take your riches with you. Second, there's no contentment in riches. Verse 8, if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. When you have God near you and for you, you don't need the extra money or extra things to give you peace and security. Hebrews 3, 5, and 6 says, Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never fail you nor forsake you. Paul really wants us to lay hold of this eternal life and not lose it. Imagine if this many of us had set our hope fully on Christ, not on money or on being right, guarding ourselves against pride, guarding ourselves against um, stinginess of our time, of our treasure, setting our hope fully on Christ, guarding ourselves against all that, and letting our joy in God because of this eternal life that we have laid hold of overflow in a wealth of generosity to a lost and without hope. This week, when your skin is thin, this week, when you're tempted to let everything of the world overwhelm you, remember generosity. Paul says to that new church and to us, it's going to change you. I used to hate talking about money till I realized it's not that God wants something from me. God doesn't need anything from me, you guys. But that it's that he wants something for me. And that makes all the difference. Let us pray. Almighty God, I thank you that you have not left us, but that you have reached out for us now. Lord, we confess our sin. We confess getting caught up. So much so that we don't even help people near us who help us when we're in trouble. Lord, may we be generous in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. you to more than anything else is you offer that faith, hope, and love to them. As you go from this place, may you go in humble confidence knowing that God has reached you and God has invited you to join him in reaching those who have yet to hear. In the name of the Father and the Son.
and the Holy Spirit will be gathering for the baptism in just 10, 12, 15 minutes as soon as we get everybody over there for the testimonies. Go now in peace. Amen. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, as a ransom.